Thank you. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I direct the Hellenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. And I'm really honored to be able to partner with the Division of Inclusion and Equity to bring you tonight's very exciting program. We have uh, two real stars when it comes to the founding and understanding the mind, the life, the context of the founding of this country. And I thought what I would do in my very, very brief remarks before um, I bring up Scott St. Louis to actually introduce our speakers is tell you just a little bit about what kinds of people we have speaking tonight. Question for you, class. If people don't get in on time this time of year, what would you say the cause is? Say, like tonight, why wouldn't people arrive at the airport on time tonight? Weather. 100% of you say that, right? OK. Our speakers were unable to make it on time because they were so locked in conversation, they missed their flight. <laughs> and so then they came in you know, on the next flight. And I just think there's something about that story which I think it really gets at the essence of their ability to enter these wonderful conversations. You see it in the book that is out there on the table, and you'll see it tonight in the chemistry they have, their ability to talk about some of the most difficult issues in America today. So thank you for being here, braving the, the weather and the elements to be here. And it's now my privilege to introduce Scott St. Louis, who is our program manager for the Common Ground, Common Good Initiative here at the Hauenstein Center. Scott, please welcome Scott. This thing's going to slide down. Thank you, Gleaves. Good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for braving the winter weather to join all of us tonight. It's great to be here with you. As Gleaves said, my name is Scott St. Louis, and I have the privilege of serving as program manager at the Howenstein Center right here at Grand Valley State University. To Vice President Jesse Bernal and all of our colleagues in the university's Division of Inclusion and Equity, we at the Howenstein Center offer you our deepest thanks for everything you've done to make this partnership event possible. We're proud to be hosting tonight's gathering as part of the annuals, uh, as part of the university's annual commemoration week honoring the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I also want to thank those of you here tonight who served on the Executive Planning Committee for this week's events. We're very grateful for your efforts in putting together some really important programs for this university. We're thankful as well for the presence of Brian Howenstein, as well as members of the Grand Valley Board of Trustees and senior management team. So to everyone I've just mentioned, as well as to all of the Howenstein Center members here tonight, thank you for everything you do for the Laker community. Let's have a round of applause. I have just a couple of friendly reminders for you tonight. Uh, those of you who are here for the Liberal Studies curriculum, Lib 100201, please don't forget after the event, find your Lib 100201 mentor, Anna. She's wearing the shirt. She told me you'll know what that means. And books will be available for purchase and signing after tonight's presentation. Please remember to keep your conversation with the authors brief to ensure that everyone in line has a chance to get their books signed. If you're new to the Howenstein Center, memberships are also available for purchase tonight should you find yourself interested in learning more about our work and supporting it. As many of you know already, the Howenstein Center has three important roles. We are a presidential study center, we're home to the Common Ground Initiative, and we are a center for leadership excellence. Our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy is currently providing more than 60 student fellows with rigorous educational and professional development opportunities. And it's our proud custom at these events to introduce one of the Howenstein Center's exemplary Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy fellows for a few remarks on what the Howenstein Center has meant to them. We call this segment the Leadership Minute, and tonight's Leadership Minute will be given by Kendra Garcia. Please help me welcome Kendra. Hello, my name is Kendra Garcia and I'm a history and Spanish double major and first year Cook Leadership Academy fellow. I was drawn to the academy because it presented a sharp contrast with my upbringing. I grew up in an extremely insular faith community, one which discouraged me from civic engagement, worldly exploration, and any being in any position of leadership. As such, when I entered college, I did not seek to engage with any extracurriculars on campus. However, over time, my ambitions grew. With the encouragement of my professors, I looked into the McNair Scholars Program and entered a new chapter 
in my college experience. As I learned of opportunities I had never considered possible, my outlook changed. I now plan to enter academia and to work with underrepresented minorities who might not see within themselves the potential to be what they truly desire. The Cook Leadership Academy has helped me expand my definition of what it is to be a leader. The wheelhouse talk given by Deborah Fur Holden was an event which inspired me to have confidence in my role as a leader on campus and to become comfortable taking up space, sharing my perspective, and building intellectual authority. I plan to take what I learned with the Cook Leadership Academy into my future as a professor and to imbue my students with the same confidence and knowledge I have gained as my time in my time as a fellow. I'm Kendra Garcia and I am a leader. Thank you, Kendra. We're here tonight to explore one of the most vexatious contradictions at the heart of the American experience. The enduring consequences of racial slavery in a country founded upon the principles of liberty and equality. To begin with, our setting is Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's mountaintop plantation just outside Charlottesville, Virginia, a community looming large on the minds of many Americans since August of 2017. Joining us are two of the country's most influential historians, Professors Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf, who recently co-authored a book titled Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. My introductions of these two scholars will be as brief as their distinguished records will allow. Annette Gordon-Reed is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard University. Her first book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, forever altered the trajectory of historical scholarship on the, found, on, on the founding generation, and thus our understanding of ourselves as Americans. In 2008, Professor Gordon Reed published The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. An elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, she received the National Humanities Medal and a MacArthur Fellowship in 2010. Peter Onuf is a senior research fellow at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. He is also the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Virginia. Likewise, an elected member of the American Academy, Professor Onuf was a founding co-host of the NPR history program, Backstory. We're pleased to announce that this is Professor Onuf's second visit to the Howenstein Center. His first came at the invitation of our director, Gleaves Whitney, for the Howenstein Center's War and Empire Conference in October 2005. Please help me welcome Annette and Peter to Grand Rapids. Thank you very much for that introduction. This is my second time in Grand Rapids. Um, some years ago, I gave a talk at the Gerald Ford um, Library, and um, I'm very, very glad to be back. And it's wonderful to be here. I'd like to start off by pointing out that Gleaves and I are wearing the same necktie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tie that binds. <laughs> Oh, I wondered how long that was going to take. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some difficult things to talk about, mm -hmm. but I think what we should first do, Annette, is to talk about the way people are thinking about our man Jefferson now. Mm -hmm. We're acutely sensitive to his reputation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly since he turned out to be a black guy <laughs> in the... In a musical. <laughs> in a musical. <laughs> uh, maybe it hasn't made it to Grand Rapids yet, but get ready for this. Talk about a, a shocking thing. And uh, more seriously, as Hamilton's star has ascended, uh, Jefferson is in another one of his troughs. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for it. And first of all, if you have deep misgivings about Jefferson, there's good reason that you should. And I would wonder where you have been if you didn't. There's no question that we have a problem to explore and that Jefferson is part of that problem. 
and that is a legacy of white supremacy, a legacy of all the pathologies associated with racial slavery, something that we are only beginning to realize the full implications of. Now, Jefferson is, of course, the author of our necktie. And in case you hadn't been close enough to read the content of our necktie, this is the Declaration of Independence. In fact, it's the signers. And in the Declaration, Jefferson articulates our national creed, things we truly, all of us, I like to think, believe and hold in our hearts. And that is the notion of equality, mm -hmm. the notion that government is based on consent, that it is our government. And there is a moment when a people realizes its responsibility to itself and to future generations to assert the right to govern itself. These are foundational sentiments, they're sentiments, they're principles, they are a creed that we live by. Yet, Jefferson was also the owner of several hundred human beings. We know, and Annette has chronicled at great length and in sensitive detail, his relationship with an enslaved person one of his enslaved persons, Sally Hemings. All of this is hard to process. How do we put it together? We have a lot of doubts about ourselves these days. We wonder what our future is collectively as a country. But one thing we certainly know, I hope we know, is that yes, we have gotten past Thomas Jefferson on the question of race and slavery. We see that contradiction. Our challenge tonight is to try to help us collectively understand what to do with that sense we have of Jefferson living a lie, of Jefferson being a hypocrite, of our founding document being somehow flawed or tainted by its author. Now that's a strong way to put it. It's not the way we feel about the Declaration and Jefferson. But if that's the way you feel, we certainly understand that. Yes, well, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to write the book. I mean, when we said we were going to do a book about Jefferson, one of the things that people ask me all the time is, why do you need another book about Jefferson? I mean, except for Lincoln, there hasn't been any American who's been written about more than Jefferson um, over the years. And, and as Peter suggested, he comes up and down. His reputation is up and down through the years. And one of the things that we thought after meeting in 1995, uh, when I asked him to read the manuscript for my first book, and we began a conversation that has gone on until a this night. Century. <laughs> a quarter century. You want to put it like that? That sounds a long time. We're really old. Yeah. <laughs> Alas. Um, she used to be really young. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The purpose of having this conversation in book form was to put down some of the things that we'd been thinking about Jefferson. And one of the things that we had observed is that this word hypocrite kept recurring or recurs in writing about Jefferson and people's thought about Jefferson. And people talked about this as if he was some, was sort of unique in that particular regard. And what we wanted to do was to try to look at Jefferson through his own eyes to see what he thought he was doing in the world to try to recapture how a person who right now is not as much in favor as Alexander Hamilton, we should say, which is a mystery, which is mysterious in its own right, but um, <laughs> you can do anything in a musical, right? <laughs> you can, you can, with hip hop. Um, to try to recapture why he was a figure, why the people of his time, many people of the time, followed him, followed his political views, his political ideas, and were inspired by him. And we wanted to write a book where we took the measure of someone who called himself Most Blessed of the Patriarchs. The title comes from a letter that he wrote to Angelica Schuyler when he was leaving, about to leave the Washington administration. And he had been beaten by Alexander Hamilton, and he was taking his marbles and going back to Monticello and 
going to leave politics forever, that's what he said, and go back to his books and his farm. And in the process, he says, you know, I'm go if I'm going home and I have my daughters there, he says, I have my fields to farm and books and so forth, and if my daughters join me there, I will consider myself as blessed as the most blessed of the patriarchs. And that title comes from that letter. And it's an interesting thing to think of, a person who describes himself as a patriarch, something that we think of as an ancient, in ancient terms, a person from the past, an individual who is at the same time thought of as a progressive. There's a story about Jefferson, mm -hmm. probably apocryphal, about his having eaten a tomato on the courthouse steps in Virginia at a time when people thought that tomatoes were poisonous. And so whether this story is true or not, but the story tells you what people thought of him, that he was the harbinger of new things, of new ideas and progress. And, that's, and people thought that he was a, a Jacobin. People thought that he was a radical at the time. And now that's sort of interesting to think of the way he's portrayed today as someone, you know, the super reactionary type. But people were fearful. People actually thought, and this is really crazy, that he was going to leave a, lead a slave revolt because of the things that he wrote about slavery in the notes on the state of Virginia, his criticisms of the institution, people saw that as being kind of out there. So it's interesting to think of a person who during his time is seen as this wild-eyed radical, um, a person who was ahead of his time on some things, to see him now portrayed as a force of reaction. And so we wanted to look at him on his own terms. And we say in the book, to, as far as we can, take him seriously when he makes pronouncements, that he does believe, the things that he says he believes, how he actually goes about making those things come into fruition, how serious he is about them, but not to look at him through the eyes that basically say, well, you know, he's just being a hypocrite. He doesn't really believe that. He had a purpose, and there were things that mattered to him, and they're not all the things that matter to us. We are talking earlier today, and we've discussed this, that now, we are, I think, rightly interested in slavery and race. Those kinds of things obsess us because those have been problems in the American story from the very, very beginning. Jefferson was obsessed with the revolution, with the American Revolution and his role in it. His view was they, he and the founders had started a country and they had gotten that ball rolling. And all he, what he cared about mainly was making sure that the United States of America, the experiment that he thought was, and Jefferson was very definitely a believer in American exceptionalism, thinking that the American experiment would go, would go forward. Slavery and race were topics that he knew were, those things were important, but they were not central to him. And one of the things you have to do as a biographer, and he's a reluctant biographer, no. is sometimes to take seriously the things that your subject took seriously. It can't just be about what we want them to do, you know, what, where we want them to go, you know, Mr. Lincoln, don't go to the theater, or, you know, <laughs> things that you know are bad, that you can just sort of wish that things were different. What does this person think? What kinds of things are important to him? And what does that tell you about his life? So the book is really a way, and our conversation, even when we're not writing, collaborating, um, just missing planes. Just missing planes. Uh, <laughs> the, the conversation is really about you know, how to figure this person out and how this person showed him who he, showed us who he was without us grafting our own needs and our own desires onto that person's life. Well, one of the ways Americans have dealt with Jefferson, who's a complex and difficult character, is to pick and choose the things they like about him. After all, he's described as a Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things that you can be engaged with and admire about Jefferson. But the real challenge is to put him back together again mm -hmm. in a way that makes historical sense in his own context, yet enables us to see where the ideas that we live by came from. Mm -hmm. And I think by choosing that title, which I think suited our purposes, we took a term which seems counterintuitive, mm -hmm. patriarch. We're talking about the great iconic figure in many ways, the person who 
first conceptualized and operationalized American democracy, his belief in the people and the idea that the people should govern themselves, as we've said. Yet, if we look at the word patriarch, one of the payoffs of understanding what he means by that is that we see that his ideas are grounded in his own time, yet what's important about him is that he believes in the possibilities, even the inevitability of progress, of improvement. Now, what's in the term patriarch? One thing that Annette didn't mention is that he also is going to look after the interests of those Oh, who, yeah. He, the, the phrase is uh, to, to look after the, the, watch for the happiness of those who labor for mine. That is to say, enslaved people. And that's infuriating, the idea. You're reading that and you're thinking, said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why can't they look after themselves, their own happiness? Just let them go. <laughs> let them go and work and make money and look for their own happiness. But he takes it seriously yeah, that's right. that this is what I'm supposed to do. As right. he's supposed to be a husband when his wife was alive, as he's a father, uh, as he's a member of a particular community, uh, that those are responsibilities. We think of patriarchy in terms of power, but he thinks of it in terms of responsibility. Right. That, as I said, that's irksome to us because that's not our understanding. That kind of paternalism and, and as a part of patriarchy is not something that we hold to. Well, I think some of you really old guys out there, and I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> And I wouldn't understand this because she's so much younger than I am, even though she's getting a lot older than she was. Uh, <laughs> Go and, ahead. And that is, the word patriarch is not one that we used commonly in my youth. But father did know best. We lived with what a properly feminist uh, critic would say. We lived in a quasi-patriarchal society in which there were these survivals of, of the old regime of male domination. The image, and I never experienced this even though I had two loving daughters, but nobody ever brought me slippers when I came home. <laughs> I've only actually learned to wear slippers recently, and, <laughs> and the kids have long since gone, and that never happened. But there was this notion that the, the little world of our homes revolved around us. And you old people, you old guys, and of course the old women have, with a sense of humor, observed these changes. This was in some ways our world. It was normal. It's not as alien as we might think, even though the term patriarch says different world. In fact, in many ways, Jefferson reminds us so much, sometimes too much of ourselves. What I'd like to propose here is that that notion of patriarchy means this capacious conception of his household, of his family, an extended family, not truly the nuclear family mm -hmm. of uh, fathers knows best, uh, but an extended family that includes enslaved people. So even as Jefferson tells us, one day these people will be free, the wheel will turn, that is inevitable, as he tells us in the notes in the state of Virginia. He's at the same time saying, in this moment, at this time, these enslaved people are my responsibility. And that's not the kind of family dynamic that we cherish, where one thing Tocqueville and other visitors to America noticed very early on was the extraordinary freedom that young people had. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy was already losing its force in the early American Republic. So Jefferson is talking about his family. In fact, I think you could write a book about family values derived from Thomas Jefferson because mm -hmm. that's what he's all about mm -hmm. at the foundation. Mm -hmm. So the idea of patriarchy means, in fact, from his perspective, it's the assertion in a good-humored way of his taking on the responsibility for his people. Mm -hmm. And here's the paradox for us. He does that. He fulfills that responsibility 
by going out into the world with the other patriarchs mm -hmm. and forming a republic, a great family of families, all men are created equal in that civic sense. Men own 99% of the property mm -hmm. at the time of the American founding. This is, of course, a convention of English common law called coverture. Mm -hmm. Only independent women, widows, could possibly hold property. Mm -hmm. It wasn't right because it had to be administered by the father, the patriarch. Mm -hmm. so that idea of patriarchy contains a lot. And by exploring that, I think we can begin to understand how Jefferson positions himself and the important thing is, and this is our subtitle, mm -hmm. he's a man of the Enlightenment, and he imagines that things will change and get better. And as he explores who he is, who he is in his own moment, with his vast reading, with his fascination with science and natural mm -hmm. philosophy, art, Jefferson, in many, in many ways, models the, Amer the modern American consumer, the consumer of everything, mm -hmm. wants to make the world his own. And this idea of Jefferson as somebody who is cultivating a sense of himself, that's the Jefferson who rings all too familiar in our day. We live in a day in which the self has triumphed at the expense of the larger society, but Jefferson's self is central to his conception of Republican society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. And he actually, that sort of sense of progress and the belief in progress, as you mentioned before, is something that I don't know that we actually have anymore to the same degree. I mean, and this is the thing that exasperates us about him because he thinks this issue of slavery mm -hmm all those kinds of things will solve themselves in due time. And of course, we're not patient with that. Uh, we, want, we want the answer then, and we wanted him to do more then than he did uh, during his lifetime. But he thought, as I said before, we created a country, we set up a Republican system, things will get better. The next generation of people will carry the ball further and on and on. And this notion of progress of the world going in one direction, well, I think we know better than that. I mean, you mm -hmm. just think about being at the beginning of a country, you start something that when he was a young man, he could not have imagined would happen, uh, that there would be something called the United States of America, that it could break away from Great Britain and, and form a country. And you're at the beginning of something and you're hopeful about it. And he was, as I said, a, a believer in American exceptionalism he naturally thinks that the next generation is going to do better. And then after that, better and better, progress and progress. And, you know, we like to believe that, or many of us believe that, but I think we might have a more realistic sense about that now, that there's, as historians, we know that there's, there's nothing inevitable about anything. And certainly the idea that things are going to get better and better and better all the time is not clear. But that's what he thought. And so when we read him, and we see him fixating on his Federalist opponents, or even after the Federalist Party's dead, still seeing them as an enemy, when this issue of slavery, the issue of the expansion of slavery, the slave prices are going up and up and up, and he's not dealing with that. He's still, not, not even fighting the last war, but fighting his enemies on terms that he'd been fighting them on since the 1790s, you say, you know, wake up, don't you see what's happening? But it's easier for us to see that because it's already happened. Right. And we can look back and we know what's going to happen. That thing that he thought was going to solve itself would be the cause of the breakup of the republic that he put in, republic he put in place. So the book and our conversations over the years are trying to look at all these things through the life of a man who's not... I mean, it's kind of, it's not, the, it's not a fair thing to do to him to sort of collapse all Amer of America into him. But so much a part of the American dilemma can be discussed through his life. Questions about race, questions about gender, questions about politics, about the people. All of those things, as he mentioned, the, the notion of a Renaissance man, Jefferson, of all the members of the founding generation, 
is a person that has so many ways into his life. You don't have to be interested in politics to be interested in Jefferson. You could be interested in music, and we have a chapter on music. You don't have to, you could be interested in science <coughs> in order to, um, to try to understand him. So this person is a way to talk about America. And we moralize about Jefferson. <coughs> what we want to suggest tonight is that Jefferson has a moral vision. It's not ours, but we need to understand it if we want to connect ourselves to his time and understand his legacy. That idea of generation is crucial. Jefferson identifies with his cohort, with the people of his age as they declare independence. This idea of you've heard of band of brothers, these commitments that are almost familial. The great thing about the idea of generation, of course, first of all, it is grounded in a notion of reproduction, sex, of families coming together, producing children. That for Jefferson is the central fact of history. That's what moves us forward. That's where his hope resides, is not in himself, I have to come up with the answers, we wish that he would have come up with some answers and done something about it. We'd like him a lot more if he just liberated his own slaves. But in doing so, he wouldn't be Jefferson. And he wouldn't leave that legacy that we have to deal with. Now, here it's important if I say he has a moral horizon, he does believe that there must be emancipation in the fullest, uh, fullness of time that slavery is a radically unjust institution. He has no question about that. But here's a story I want to tell you that I think would give you a sense of Jefferson's moral perspective. In the Declaration of Independence, he says, announcing the birth of a new American people, he says to his British brethren, because we were once part of that family, that English or British nation, that greater British nation. We could have been a great and free people together, he says in his draft of the Declaration of Independence. He's saying this plaintively to his British cousins across the ocean. We could have been a great and free people together. The key word is people. We were once one people. Now we are two no, now we are three because we have suddenly become aware that there's a third people here in our midst, a captive nation, a captive nation of enslaved Africans who didn't come here to colonize a new world and to extend the great British empire across the ocean. They came here to do the labor that would yield the results, the crops, that would enrich Americans. Jefferson describes a personal progress in a letter he writes to Edward Coles, a neighbor and sometimes secretary of James Madison, who was determined to follow through on the promise of liberation and emancipation because of the way he understood the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson says, no, 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 don't go. Don't leave Virginia. Don't take your slaves to Illinois and free them, which he does eventually. And of course, Coles is the hero of that story. But what Jefferson says very interestingly is that in colonial days, we thought of slaves as if they were domestic animals, horses and cattle in a sense, as the sheer instrument or tool of doing the work for the master, that is a fairly accurate description. It's a denial of humanity. It's something that you can't sustain. And Jefferson, at this moment, sees as one people, the American people, declares itself independent, no longer part of this other people, this British people, this colonizing imperial people, now we are an American people, and then there is a third people, the enslaved Africans. 
So here I propose to you what his moral horizon is as he looks at this problem. What is his solution? It's a global solution. The solution is emancipation, yes, expatriation, or what we call colonization, mm -hmm. or you might call deportation. All those terms are loaded, but they're all associated with each other. It means that the enslaved captive nation must be free, but it can't be here in America. This is the radical source of our disillusion with Jefferson because we can't find in him a commitment to a multiracial republic, to integration, to the very idea of America that most of us cherish, that we all did come from different places. But if you put this in the context of his participation in the American Revolution and a declaration made on behalf of the white people of British America that they were a people. And if being a people is the threshold of enjoying your rights, it's one thing to say that everybody naturally has rights, Jefferson, ideas are about natural rights. But those rights don't mean anything if they're not in a civic context if they're not enforceable, if you don't live by them. That is the commitment Republicans make to each other, that the signers of the Declaration made to each other is a commitment to living together as a people. And that was a moral necessity, as Jefferson saw it, for enslaved people. They must be a people too. They are a people, a captive people. And for us, Jefferson, that's the original sin, you might even say. They are here. They don't think of themselves as Africans. They've been here in many cases for generations. All of this is true. But it's the idea of a people, which is the central idea. And that's the idea that we inherit from Jefferson. Because for Jefferson, it was the revolutionary generation that made itself in a people. And he imagined in the future, future generations, that people would renew itself, it would improve, it would discover new things. It would perform and enact that progress, that enlightenment that was central to his vision. Mm -hmm. The idea of people can be and must be abstracted from the people as Jefferson understood it. And not just abstracted to say, yeah, you could be a people too. But of course, we see the moral imperative as we look back and moralize about Jefferson of that people being as inclusive and capacious as possible. And that's what fits very much with why one of the reasons we're here thinking about this week and celebrating Martin Luther King and his speech. If you go back to his speech in 1963, on the, march, on the march on Washington, and he references the Declaration, Jefferson's words in the Declaration, thinking of it as a promissory note, promissory note, that this is the idea that a creed that we're supposed to live by, and he does something that Jefferson could never have imagined, or I, I think it's probably, you want to psychoanalyze Jefferson, projection, Jefferson in the notes says one of the reasons that the, the blacks and whites have to be separated is that there would be eternal conflict. Whites would never give up their prejudices against blacks, and blacks would never forget what had happened to them. Um, how can you love a country that's treated you the way blacks were treated in the United States? And he couldn't imagine, seriously, probably could not imagine a king-like figure or the idea of somebody who would say, all right, that was in the past. We are now one people. We've lived here as a group of people. And now we can go forward. If this is the American creed and if you actually believe it, then you take that and you move into the future. You're not hostage to the past. And so he's thinking about generations as well. He talks about the arc of liberty and that things happen 
over time. You have to bend it. <laughs> you have to work at it. But that's why it made sense for us, I think, to deal with this particular figure whom African Americans have been addressing since Benjamin Banneker wrote to Jefferson in the 1790s. And later on, David Walker in Walker's Appeal talks about Jefferson. <clears throat> W.E.B. Du Bois talks about Jefferson. King talks about Jefferson. Frederick Douglass uses Jefferson. Not Washington, not Madison, not Hamilton. Uh, this figure who is problematic mm -hmm. but is useful both for the optimism that he has, the good part of it, but also the parts that are dispiriting. That is the American character, and he represents those two things in one, one body. And you can tease all of the, these things out by talking about him uh, and talking about his life. And so it's not a question. This is the thing historians, I mean, history is not just about your favorite people, you know, <laughs> the people that you want to spend time with. I mean, that might be part of it, but it really is the people who tell you about this country, who give you an opportunity to talk about the central issues that have been at play since the very beginning. And there really isn't anybody that I can think of, certainly from the American founding, who is better for that kind of conversation. Um, you can like him because he liked books. You can like him because of the music. You can like him because of the botany. You can like him from all kinds of architecture, all those kinds of things, but you still do have to grapple with the other side of the story. Uh, this issue of family, and you know, we, we give people a chance to talk here. Um, you know, obviously, <laughs> this person who doesn't believe that blacks and whites could live together in harmony ha was married to a woman who had six half siblings who were enslaved. The whales, the Hemings whales, children, Sally Hemings. Who would eventually, with whom he would have children, was his wife's half sister. So he knew very, very well that slavery, the institution of slavery itself, provided opportunities for mixing, created families. And then when he dies in his will, um, he, he has to request the legislature to allow them to, to remain in the state of Virginia because the law, 1806 law, said that if you were emancipated, uh, you had to leave the state within a year or be re-enslaved unless you got permission to do so. And most uh, slave owners who freed slaves had to petition the legislature to do that. And he petitions the legislature to do it, and he says, explaining why they should be allowed to remain in Virginia, because this is where their families and their connections are. And that's a simple answer. <laughs> they remain in the state because this is where their families and their connections are. And this was a time when a number of slave-owning Virginians were freeing people up in their wills, but on the condition that they go to Liberia. So that could have been an option for him as well. But because he knew these people, he knew John Hemings, he knew Burl Colbert, he knew Joseph Fawcett, and obviously he knew Madison and Eston, the two youngest children. He knew who they were, and they should be allowed to remain in the state with their families and their connections. And as I've said, that's the reason that all African Americans, and Peter is suggesting this, that that's why they all should stay, because this is where their families and their connections were. And he knew that when it came to people in his intimate circle, in his own life. It was constantly about family and connection. But writing in the Republic of Letters, putting forth a plan, there was something different, and that had nothing to do with the people that he knew and he loved. And people asked me very often, they said, well, if he were here, what question would you ask him? You know, and, I, and they always think that it's definitely about Sally Hemings, which I wouldn't do. Um, but to say, you know, are you gonna make white men send their children to Africa? People send their families to Africa. What is the purpose of that? What is that about? Um, it's just a fascinating, yeah. fascinating topic. You want to say something else? I think I'll I think we should let these people because I think that's really good, and I think that is our discomfort mm -hmm. with Jefferson. Mm -hmm. But when he says those things mm -hmm. in notes in the state of Virginia, it's in the context of the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. and I think there are 
two related thoughts I'd like to conclude with on my side. And one is that idea of the inevitability of race warfare. It's like a war between hostile nations. Mm -hmm. And it's not a mere abstraction when Jefferson first writes it down mm -hmm. because his slaves have fled to the British because back in 1775, Lord Dunmore had organized uh, black slaves from Virginia, the Chesapeake, to be part of the counter-revolution. This is a state of war. You understand why at that moment in 1782 that he, in the wake of Yorktown, and who knows when the next war would come, and it did come soon, both in the Caribbean, the, in Saint-Domingue, but then again, of course, the War of 1812, another war for independence in which the British are fomenting slave rebellion. That notion that we must separate, that's a kind of a geopolitical, geopolitical moral imperative, well, that's what he sticks with for the mm -hmm. rest of his life, despite the fact that Annette quite rightly emphasizes the way that is in radical tension with the lived reality of the actual people who don't think of themselves as an alien nation. And that leads me to the second and my concluding thought, which I think brings us to King's testimony mm -hmm. and to the history of African Americans and the centrality of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They would never forgive us, Jefferson says in the notes, mm -hmm. but time and time again, African-American slaves and children of slaves have forgiven their masters. That is the remarkable fact. And that is the resource that we, I think, can as a people draw on, mm -hmm. is that sense of forgiveness. And that means an honest accounting with the history. We all need to know about this. We need to know about the experience of enslaved people. We need to know how much they are a part of the American people. They did not want to go back. It wasn't back for them. They weren't Africans until they were exiled from Africa. They lived in America, and when they organized their own churches, their own communities, they insisted they were African-American. They insisted on their claim to be Americans and to be part of that people that began on July 4th, 1776. That, in many ways, is the central story of American history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we learn from history. It's not to say, oh, Jefferson, let's get rid of Jefferson. Jefferson doesn't really matter. He's the guy who gave us the words. He gave us an idea. He was a thinker. But those are our ideas to work with. Those are our mm -hmm. promises to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And that's what King saw. And that was the beauty of that speech and melding that to the African-American tradition and his own Christianity, which was a big part of his, particular, of his life. And that's why he could use those words and take them and make them something to aspire to and something that would inspire Americans. We have your questions. I think we have microphones here. For this piece. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my name is Rick Stevenson. I write on slavery and the Middle Passage. Um, when we talk about slavery, one of the, the most underrepresented aspect is the sexual abuse that black women experience and rape. Mm -hmm. So as we look at Jefferson and Hemings, would you characterize their relationship um, as one of love and uh, commitment, or would you have found that in the commonplace of rape? The second question is, uh, in 1669, when you have the um, Casual Killing Act, what role did Jefferson play in that, and has your research indicated any responsibility on that? Mm -hmm. um, act on his part. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, Sally Hemings, and people ask me this question all the time. <laughs> Usually it's more towards the end of, <laughs> of the question, <laughs> Anta Perry. Um, but thank you. Um, love is a tricky business. 
<laughs> Sally Hemings, the, the story that her son tells, that their son tells about her, her, uh, her relationship, her connection, whatever you want to call it, to Jefferson, is that she's in Paris where she has a chance to be free. And she's there with her brother. And they want to stay there. And he doesn't want her to stay there. He wants her to come back to Virginia with him. And she makes a decision to come back to Virginia with him when he promises her that her children would be free when they're 21 and that she would have a nice life at Virginia, in, in Virginia, that he would you know, give her a nice life there. Now, people say, well, what choice did she have in that situation? I think she's different, the, my conception of it, is she's different from Celia, another woman, an enslaved woman who killed her master after, year, after rape, because the law was on Sally Hemings' side. And James Hemings was there. Her brother was eight years older than she. They had been, Jefferson was paying them wages because he believed that they were free there in, in, in France. So she had a wider range of options than the Af African-American enslaved women who were in Virginia. Now, once she comes back to Virginia, she's totally under his control. I mean, she doesn't have, if she decides that she doesn't want to continue, that's not her choice then. But the initial decision to come back with him, she had, she had more leeway than other African-American women who were totally under the laws of slavery <clears throat> and couldn't have protested. So, but that's the difficult thing about love and feelings. It's hard to say, but it, it, it was just a decision for, made to ensure the welfare of her kids so that she could be with her family to come back to, if she and James had stayed in Paris, she probably never would have seen her mother and her sisters and all those people again. And it sounds like her, her son says this was a treaty, that this was a deal between the two of them. Now, whether that include, included love, I don't know. Is it possible? Sure. I mean, one of the things that's difficult to grasp or to, you have to remember is that Sally Hemings' father was white her grandfathers were white. There's no reason for us to think or assume that she would think the only partner for her would be a black man. I mean, I have a, we have a sense of race that's probably very different from her sense of race uh, at the time. This is a family of people who up until the 70s did not marry people who did not look like them. And so, when people ask me, is it possible for her to have loved him or whatever, and you, that's not what you asked me, but you, you didn't talk about in terms of possible, you think about, well, who else would she have been with? I'm trying to envision who would be the husband of Sally Hemings, given their family values, given her situation, and the children that she has by Virginia law um, are white. And so if you think about being a person in that world where blackness meant you know, enslavement, captured and sold back into slavery, you know, oppression, all those kinds of things. The idea to have children who could escape all of that and leave that might have been attractive to her. But there's no, I mean, her sense of race is probably not, was, was probably, well, obviously, I don't even say probably, it definitely was not my sense of race because of the time period she lived in and her circumstances. Um, but love, I don't know. What, do you think about, do you think about love, Peter? <laughs> I just live it. <laughs> no, we've had long, TMI. I remember we've had long arguments about love. Uh, I think it's a great question. That is, uh, and the lesson uh, I would draw from listening to you two, and I, that was a, a nice exchange, as Annette suggests, the very idea of rape is not fixed for all time. Uh, I don't want to sound like some kind of sleazy relativist and say, well, whatever's going down. But things do change. In fact, the job of historians is to try to track those changes. And it's very hard to avoid the sins of anachronism mm -hmm. that is we have a definition of rape. In fact, we feel it. Mm -hmm. It's not just it's in clear. the laws under which we live. 
uh, but it's in our natural sense of it. Yeah, it's yeah. in our it's it's in the air. It's in the culture, and the remarkable thing about uh, me too is a heightened consciousness of how it might be in the process of redefinition as we speak. Mm -hmm. And if you have that sense about your own lifetime, then think about history in that way. This is not to extenuate or apologize. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the things I wanted to say. And I should say this, we should ask somebody else to answer a question, ask a question. I mean, you, the fear is that by turning Tom and Sally into Tom and Sally living and loving at Monticello, is that people will minimize what was endemic to slavery, which was rape, the rape of African. And, and the idea, because he's such a visible figure, and she's a visible figure, that you don't want people, and because of who he is, you don't want people to use that to say that rape wasn't wasn't endemic, wasn't a central part of all of this. You don't want people to romanticize it. So on mm -hmm. one hand, we, we do have to historicize, see it in a historical sense. Right, right. No, but right. by the same token, you're concerned about the uses. You know how people who are of bad faith, of which there are many, <laughs> unfortunately, will use that uh, to say that this wasn't a problem. But on the other hand, I think of her sister, who asked to be sold to a particular white man and lived with him on Main Street in Charlottesville had children with him, and when he, she died, when he died, he left her the house, which is hard to, how do you leave a slave a house, right? You're not supposed to. He never, he never formally freed her, but he left the house to her. He recognized the kids, and the people in the community called her his common-law wife. So what do you do about that? I mean, he owned her, but clearly by what they're doing, there's something else going on there rather than Celia. I mean, I can't resist saying one more thing, and that is it's <laughs> living outside the law and not having legal status. That's the great crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and to extend uh, honorary common law status mm -hmm. is a way of saying, oh, 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 no, you're different. Mm -hmm. We'll treat you as if. Mm -hmm. And it's the given condition of all enslaved people. That's a crime against the whole people. Yeah, and because she couldn't marry. I mean, Mary and Tom, that's what I'm talking about couldn't marry. He could only, the only way that they could live together without getting in trouble for fornication, which was against the law, was to have that kind of legal relationship. My, my name is Ron Strauss, and my mother descends from some black slaves mm -hmm. and plantation owners of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And when, when we did the DNA, we found out we're related to many of the uh, different slave families like Carter mm -hmm. and uh, Hunter and there was other ones mm -hmm. as well Harrison's and but anyway I have a a question regarding Jefferson being so smart so intelligent so open-minded about many things and creating a new nation and everything else and having all these uh, free labor of slaves and then having his own relative family running the plantation, why was he such a failure as a businessman <laughs> and financially failure? Didn't I don't understand the, that. Didn't go to the leadership program here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it just seems like I, it puzzles you know, me on well, how he treated his slaves versus other plantation owners or anything like that. I mean, it, there's a difference. Well, he... One thing is, I don't. Jefferson was not interested in money other than as a way of paying bills. He was not. In order to to be a good business person, you have to pay attention to it, and that's not really no, not what he was paying attention to. I mean, Monticello is sort of like a backdrop for him to write and you know have an ornamental farm and do those kinds of things. When he gave over the uh, stewardship of the plantation to his grandson, agricultural output increased three times the amount because he just, that's not what he was interested in. That's why, you know, he's, you think of him with Monticello, he's away from Monticello half the time. He, the longest stretch of time he's in a plantation society is when he retires. 
other than when he was a young boy growing up. But I mean, you know, so he's of this, he's in the place, he loves the place, but actual, I mean, Madison Hemings, his son said, you know, he cared but little, you know, for agricultural pursuits. <laughs> And people say, wow, but Jefferson, you think of farms and farmers and yeah, so forth. Yeah. He said it's, his it's with his mechanics that he spent the most time. And when he says mechanics, they means carpenters, people who are building the house, people who are working on the house. He was a woodworker himself. So, you know, <laughs> agricultural stuff is not, the business side of this was not something that really interested him that much. Because if he'd wanted to find out about business and the business of agriculture, he could have done it. But he didn't. He said at one point he'd never seen a hogshead of his tobacco packed in his life. Proudly. And he said that in 1800. <laughs> um, so that didn't interest him. You, you know, the things you do well are the things that you pay attention to. And it may have been a good to. thing that he was a lousy businessman. If you want to look for the triumph of business values in the old South, which is the modernizing South in the decades leading up to the Civil War, when you want people bringing expertise of time management techniques, uh, the equivalent of having an MBA approach to running a plantation, really rational, uh, maximizing yield and all this stuff, uh, then you can see a new and frightening face of slavery, modern slavery, in which uh, slave and slave people were simply cogs in a well-oiled machine there was a, it was so poorly managed, Jefferson's plantations, that there was air to breathe and uh, people could make lives there. I'm not romanticizing it. I'm not saying, oh, it's a great thing he was a lousy businessman. In fact, the thing that enslaved people feared most is that their lousy businessmen owners would have to sell them away. Yeah, go bankrupt and have to sell them. I mean, he, the, most of the people at Monticello was not a profitable farm. Most of the people there, he had a huge percentage of children and older people, not, not as many people working in the field. Most people were at Monticello, were, a lot of them were working on the house, which doesn't bring money. That's a money pit, you know. And so this is not something that he would have been much better off in Boston. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Blake Mazurik. I'm a teacher. I teach middle school uh, U.S. history. Mm -hmm. I opened the school year up with uh, a unit on Jefferson and slavery. Whoa. So I'm wondering if you're available uh, at the... <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> just check your calendars. <laughs> if you <would. laughs> this so is if right you up the alley. 500 middle school <laughs> exactly. students together. They, I've talked to middle school. I'm before. telling you, they, they are, are so lost. savvy. Oh, they are. And the gentleman's question maybe. over here is a question that comes up with, right. with these kids a lot about Sally and, and, mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. um, but we examine his, his views on slavery. Uh, we look at the, the Coles letter. We look at Benjamin Banneker. We, we do all these uh, analysis throughout his life. And I'm right. going to ask you if you would just address his seeming uh, change of attitude about slavery. Early in of Virginia, he seems to have this more abolitionist, I hate to use mm -hmm, the word abolitionist, mm -hmm. uh, tone to it. But then there does seem to be a resignation that it's not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not going to get You're there. So right. And uh, and so there seems to be this uh, night and day approach to the way he views. So, you know, by the time he's at his deathbed, where is he standing uh, I'll on give this you a very issue? short answer. Thank you. And that will be unusual for me. Uh, <laughs> and I would say, take that notion of state of war. It's urgency is the word we're looking for. When he writes notes in the state of Virginia, when he later says uh, during the Haitian, uh, what becomes the Haitian Revolution, uh, that he fears that it's going to spread to Virginia and, and uh, uh, our, our children will be slaughtered. During the War of 1812, and you notice that the letter to Coles is written in the middle of, or toward the end of the War of 1812, it's in moments of radical geopolitical instability when the very future of the republic in the Atlantic world is at risk. That's the short answer. Uh, because in peacetime, that's when, and he uses the image of, of, uh, of sleeping. He goes into a kind of a somnolent, uh, uh, he's not urgent anymore. Then he talks about, well, the next generation, that's why Cole shouldn't leave or by the time he dies, it's 
it may be an age. Mm -hmm. Indeterminate length, but it has to happen eventually. Mm -hmm. Talk about the arc of history. Well, let's take that arc out mm -hmm. another millennia or a millennium or two. Well, we talk about this in the book as well, about France and how that influences his idea about slavery. France being there and seeing French peasants and how long it took to get to, for them to be able to rise up. And also being in a house with James and Sally Hemings, where he is, he, the face of slavery is mm -hmm. the face, faces of his wife's half siblings, whom he's paying in France and has, they have free movement in France. He's living in a, a society without slavery and yet they are they have the legal relationship to him back in Virginia. It's different in France, then he's not going to be able to enforce that. But that gives him a sense of how he can be. And they become the faces of slavery right. for them, not the people down the mountain. It's the people whom he is treating well, the people who he, you know, is paying at the time and has relationships with that for him. Now they do, they want to be free. James, you know, eventually ends up you know, Jefferson frees him and he goes off and he's traveling and so forth. And Robert, their brother, those people, uh, they become what, he sees himself as a slave owner by the way he treats them. And that allows him to say, and I'm good. You know, I'm good because with these particular people, this is how I am, but these are his wife's siblings. And that's why he, I mean, that's why he has that connection to them. It's totally unreal. And he tries to enact this notion of himself as the benevolent, the thing that drives, the, the, the benevolent slave owner, the thing that we deny. Uh, but for him, he sees yeah. himself clearly that way. And once you start thinking that you can make slavery better, then the sort of idealism of his youth, mm -hmm. that's gone. Yeah. You're lost when you think you can make it good and, and treat people well. That's not, that's not gonna, that's not gonna help you. Sure. <laughs> The Banneker, uh, when he has an exchange with Banneker about mm -hmm. uh, the, the almanac that uh, Banneker wrote, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he's got high praise uh, for Banneker. He's like, you know, this is amazing work, and he can truly see where, mm -hmm. you, you know, the equal brethren and things of this nature. So how does he, you know, clearly he sees uh, Hemings and others with that, that immediate, that intimate look to mm -hmm. them. Does he, in that letter, because my students will ask, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of channeling some of the questions they ask me. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but they're wondering, well, he seems to have high praise, yet the, the slaves down the mountain don't seem to have that same, uh, he doesn't seem to have that same view, or at least they're... Well, he can't a, have people working right. on his plantation okay, who he thinks <laughs> are, you know, mathematicians. I mean, what, uh, you can't, you can't, I don't know what's worse. It's so funny. People say, well, George Washington, I have, I have an idea of a bad New Yorker cartoon, would be a tasteless New Yorker cartoon with people in the field saying, oh, this is not so bad. At least Master thinks we're equal. The question is, <laughs> d is it really, really better to, th to think that black people are equal to you and you can buy and sell people? I mean, that, that naked power, that naked power would be something frightening you know, really, versus somebody who has to make up a bunch of stories about, well, you know, they're not really like us, and that's why I get to do this stuff. This is, he, he can't think Benjamin, he would have Benjamin Banneker, you know, working in the fields. They have to be, they can't be, they're equal. They're, it, that's the only way you can sustain that, is to f tell a story about these people that makes this okay, if you think it's wrong. Right? If you think it's wrong, you have to say, yeah, it's wrong, but these people really aren't ready in a way, right, and maybe right. one day they'll be ready. But this sort of, you know, oh, they're equal, but I can make you, I can buy and sell you. That doesn't make any sense, you know? Okay. I love this. Um, and I have read several books on Jefferson and on Sally Hemings. And I've derived personally that I think he really loved her. He was a male. He was in his 40s. And he was single. He was in Paris. You know, he dressed her <laughs> like a queen. Like... <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, I think love is, he was attracted. He was a male. 
And she was attractive. Well, what I, well, I think I don't have any problem believing that he was attached to her. I don't. I guess what I don't understand is why do what difference. I guess I do understand what difference it makes. People want to like him, and he seems more likable, if that's the truth. But I don't think it's a crazy idea. Do you know what I mean? I, I've never, I don't, so, yeah, he did, but there are so many other things he didn't do that are important as well. Um, I, this is his wife's half-sister. Yeah, excellent. And I don't, I don't have a problem believing now about her. We have never... The thing, I don't believe that he had a purely sexual interest in her for 38 years. That's not how things like that work. Uh, and th so from his perspective, I can see that, but we don't know about her because, as I said, when he comes back from, when they come back to Virginia, from she Paris. doesn't have any option. But I guess his wife didn't have any option either once you, <laughs> once you marry. Uh, well, then it was act, part but. of... It was part of the family. She wasn't a total stranger because no. this was his wife's half sister. Yeah. So then, coming back, I'm thinking of um, in the the books I've read, his children seem to be resentful that he would, to my knowledge, and change this. He never called them son or daughter. Mm -hmm. He was respectful to them, mm -hmm. but they all, especially Harriet. And, and Beverly, because he wanted Beverly to stay with him. And Beverly, all he would have needed is for Jefferson to say, stay with me, son. He, Beverly, would have stayed. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, uh, this is Barbara Chase Rabu, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, a, and that's, there's enough to conceptualize things in that, in that way. Madison Hemming said that he was kind, but not, affectionate the way he was with his grandchildren and that was bouncing you on your knee and all of that kind of thing and so I, I think he want I think he wanted the children to be white and go off and mm -hmm. live the lives of white people because that was the only way they would get any respect in society so it's the kind of thing if he had claimed them I mean being the Negro son of Thomas Jefferson and three dollars and sixty-five cents will get you a cup of coffee at at Starbucks. I mean, it didn't mean anything. I mean, he's talking about Jefferson's thinking about citizenship, what it means. He does. He says that a person who is white by Virginia law, who's freed, would be a free white citizen of the United States of America. That was the most important thing in the world. That was a big, big deal. And big. he gave all the children. That and I think that was commemorable on his part. The other thing is that I think if I and please challenge me, he was a Unitarian. That was his. That was basically his background me of too. religion. How many Unitarians out there? <laughs> no, nah, no Unitarians. Every young man in America is going to be a Unitarian. He said. So Jefferson thought. Yeah, right. Wrong. And, and they end up with me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean that that yeah, that was so we talk about that in the book too. We have a, a chapter okay. on religion, um, discussing that, that he thought that Unitarianism was gonna be the way for the future. <laughs> Alas, no. Okay. Thank you. I just um thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Any other questions? We have another question. And then Peter. Oh, we have you. one more coming up. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, in an old book by uh, Merrill Peterson on mm -hmm. Adams and Jefferson, mm -hmm. he said that those two old codgers dying the same day, mm -hmm. Adams died finally more hopeful of the future than Jefferson. Mm -hmm. um, so the, your, your sense of, uh, his, his sense of progress, uh, there's also this note in him um, echoing the old classical Republican idea of history as a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. That we have progress and we have relapse. We have progress and relapse. That's why you have to water the tree of liberty with blood every 20 years. Mm -hmm. So could you, could you talk about these two conceptions and what you might think is the balance in him mm -hmm. between hope about progress mm -hmm. and this, this perennial corruption that those, those lousy Federalists represent and, <laughs> and, and other people? Yeah, no, it's a great question. 
Uh, I'd say, and it's a rich question, I'd say one answer is that that notion of the cycle, which is drawn from classical sources and the inevitability of decline and fall, uh, for Jefferson is as incorporated in his conception of generational renewal. Uh, that is, in the lived experience of human beings, and we old folks know this as we approach our sunset years, I think maybe the sunset is already happening, uh, <laughs> that our end as individuals is, uh, is before us. Uh, the classical theories, in a way, project that onto uh, as if a, the republic, uh, ancient republics, were a kind of organism that has its moment, then it dies. The beautiful idea of the immortality of the nation or the people because of generational renewal, which Jefferson would then make the foundation of his conception of constitutionalism truly living because renewed every generation by a new constitution, perhaps, as he suggests to Jefferson, uh, to Madison in 1789. I don't know about the um, uh, uh, Merrill's suggestion about yeah, Adams I being more I don't, hopeful. I don't think so. Uh, there's an image that uh, we cite from their correspondence, and you've probably looked at it, the Adams-Jefferson correspondence in their late years, when uh, Jefferson conjures up the idea of Jefferson and Adams in heaven. This is the, was the, some of the hardest things for me to get my mind around as a true Unitarian who doesn't believe in anything, uh, <laughs> that there could be, that Jefferson could believe in this kind of, uh, he was a materialist, could believe in, in the continuation of life in some sense, and even, and he knows that this is, this is uh, of course, doesn't really think that he and Adams wouldn't fall through those clouds, particularly Adams, because they're, he's so heavy, uh, <laughs> but that he imagines, and this is the consolation of future history, of looking down and seeing, uh, getting back to your tree of liberty, seeing the light spread, seeing at the expense of all that blood, seeing people coming into the gift of self-government and, and, and becoming a people. The fields of, battlefields of Europe will be drenched in rivers of blood, but eventually these people will be free. All peoples will be free. That's Jefferson's vision at its bloodiest and at its most hopeful but the bloodiness suggests that this is, this is life. These are real people who pass, who come into the world. It's, 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 a, it's an ordeal life in a way. A but the great consolation mm -hmm. is hope for the future. So that image of joining Adams in, in <laughs> the spectacle of liberation, of people becoming free, and I think that's what he dies with. He dies in a lot of pain. Uh, he does have uh, the university, but of course the university is big pain too. Uh, but, but he has that notion, he has to die. And things have to get better. And what he wants to do, and this is what we say he does in his prayers, is he prays for those future generations and that this will all unfold in the full, fullness of time. It's taking what you might say is a, a Christian, conventional theological notion of the afterlife and folding it into and making it the animating spirit of his conception of history. Good. We have time for one more. Make Please. it good. <laughs> no pressure. All right. Oh, no, she's walking out on us. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know a little bit about the Northwest Ordinance. Oh. He was presumably an initial drafter of it at one particular point in time. That's right. And Article 6 of it specifically yep. prohibits any kind of slavery in yep. those territories yep. that are going to develop. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't understand how he could be sort of taking, you know, he was somebody who was a signatory to it who would go ahead and say, well, there aren't going to be slaves there, but yet have it set for the future. 
because this is 83, 84, 87 we're talking about. Well, 84 particularly. Mm -hmm. Correct. But I'm trying to figure out, you've characterized him as sort of a person who left it to the future to be done, and the future is already there. In yeah. Well, you know from the 1784 47. ordinance, since I gather you're one of the three people in the, in, in, well, I'm exaggerating, there's one Unitarian out there. Probably three people know about the Northwest Ordinance. I wrote, well, you'll have, you'll I wrote a book it. about the damn thing. Look, you and I know about it. <laughs> That's all that needs to know about it. But how does it fit into that yeah. scheme that you've okay. laid out? But you recall that the 1784 Ordinance, which would apply to the entire West, mm -hmm. doesn't apply until the year 1800. Correct. Right. And that suggests at this moment, getting back to the answer to the middle school teacher, uh, at this moment, he's seen in the wake of just having read the notes yeah. in the state of Virginia, that there is some urgency to deal with this problem, right? And so now we're in speed up time, urgent. We will have dealt with this problem by 1800. And uh, the fact that there will be no slavery there will both be a nudge, as we say in behavioral economics now. People say, oh, well, I'm not gonna take my slaves there but it also will be that this is going to be colonized and populated by free white families. He's confident of that. That confidence cannot and does not last long. Right, but he's making it happen, and I think that's a real assertive piece on his thought process. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.